going to introduce now our next speaker. He is a member of the District of Columbia Bar and has worked with a multitude of conservation organizations and governments to evaluate strategies and secure improvements in federal and international law and policy in the areas of natural resource conservation, anti-corruption measures, international development, and socially and environmentally responsible investment. John has served in the Policy Bureau at the U.S. Agency for International Development, evaluating and reporting to Congress and the public on the environmental impact of USAID and proposed World Bank projects. As Chief Counsel at Defenders of Wildlife for over 10 years, he was a leader in the Endangered Species Coalition. He has served as the Policy Director of the Society of Conservation Biology since 1997. As a director, he has assisted the Society of Conservation Biology in creating a policy program that allows conservationists to be major players in policy making. So without further ado, Mr. John Fischer. Actually, it's, it's 2007, but that's long enough anyway. I've been at the Society of Conservation Biology. I was under the impression we'd have a computer here. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Not that these slides are going to be much more entertaining than that black screen. <laughs> I don't have very many beautiful pictures. In fact, almost virtually zero. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. We, we deal with law. We deal with regulations and statutes. And sometimes they're really boring, but sometimes they're very powerful so we learn. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of what some of the tools are in the law, and also some of the tools are in the process of organizing to use the law and to make the law better. And we'll follow up with that with our working groups or committees later this afternoon on some of the things about how to organize and then how to use uh, some of the laws. While he's doing that, I'll give you a tiny bit of background about myself besides what was in that. One of the things I did when I was essentially your age was help to organize the public interest research groups in this country. I organized the Indiana one with other people. And those are PERGs, as they're called now. In many states, they have them. They do environmental work and consumer work. Now they're Environment America and Public Interest Research Group doing most of the consumer stuff. And when I did it, we all did it together. When I was an undergraduate, I ran the Erlen College chapter. We, did, we organized the Indiana group. Then when I was a law student, I was chairman of the Indiana organization. We organized a national organization. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated from law school, I came to DC to set up the first US PERG office which did for students around the country what they wanted them to do in D.C. They were lobbyists for students. And they still exist. The U.S. program is pretty big, so is Environment America. But the point is, we did it at a meeting just like this. In the mid-70s, we met at Iowa State, a couple other places, to build an organization. We decided to support a movement. We support each other. And we finally opened an office in D.C. of our own. Not that you need that nowadays, necessarily, with all the stuff you can do with the internet and all that. But we got it, we got it done. And we helped empower the state groups because we helped to focus their work in DC effectively like we were just sharing from our previous speaker. And we also empowered it back the other way. You know, we got stuff done in DC to help them. And so we take a project that one, some group had an idea of starting, and then 30 groups would be doing it all at once, 30 states across the country. Because we helped expedite that, that process. So you all can do that here. Before I even get to the slide again, let me just tell you a couple other things about who you guys can motivate. You just heard that Barbara Mikulski, he didn't name her name, but she's, that's the Senator's chairman, chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee of the Senate. That's the most powerful <coughs> position nowadays, because much gets done through the appropriations process that used to get done through other processes, because so many things are blocked, but you need to spend money to run the government. So there's always some kind of an appropriations bill. So Maryland, Thompson State, you guys, where are you? Right there, okay. <coughs> you have job number one, which is talking to Barbara Mikulski about this $20 million that needs to get spent the right way, okay? But she's gonna say, well, what, what are my subcommittee chairs gonna tell me? What about the subcommittee on cure appropriations where Fish and Wildlife Service gets its money? What about the subcommittee on foreign operations where USAID gets most of its money in the State Department? Do they support this? How many tiger schools do you think are on those two subcommittees in the Senate? And mind you, the Senate's more likely to do this than the House is because they're more interested in cutting money everywhere, but they have to have a, an accommodation of some sort to run the government. So I suggest that you remember a certain telephone number and use it for these senators. Have you got it? Have you, is there enough ink left in your pens to write down 10 digits? Yes. 202 224 3121. That's the capital operator switchboard number for the Senate. They'll also get you to the House. That's easy to go through first. 
224-3121. It's always been that, almost ever since they invented the telephone. But anyway, so you can just call up your center. So let me just tell you right now. I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. This is not exhaustive. I just circled this in my chair a minute ago. In State Foreign Operations Related Program Subcommittee, where they fund State Department and the ID mostly. Guess who is the ranking Republican on that subcommittee? Any guess? Senator. Who's your favorite senator here? Not favorite. Lindsey Graham. He chairs the Republican side of that subcommittee. It's his thing. So if you go ask Lindsey Graham, in your bill, would you support this? And you have two the main school here, but others, you know, saying, yeah, we want this, and it's just a little $20 million, and it's already sort of scheduled up in the president's request. No big deal. On the Democratic side, you have Marilyn, Mikulski, Mikulski sits there, LSU, Mary Landrieu, Princeton, Lautenberg. Half the Democrats, virtually, are Tiger State Democrats on that subcommittee. You know, on the other subcommittee that deals with this, you've got Roy Blunt, Missouri. Isn't that a Tiger State? Yeah, of course it's a Tiger <laughs> He's your senator. Okay. <clears throat> so you go ask Roy Blunt, and you got other people who want to help out. And Tim Reeser, the staff director for Ladies of Vermont, he is probably, those two are probably the most powerful conservationists or global conservation in the United States for the past 10 years at least. They held things together that would have been destroyed. So it went for Senator Leahy and his staff for Tim Reeser. You've seen all this stuff, the AIB Biodiversity Program, Climate Change Program, they're going to be down to almost nothing through the bad years. And they, they've done it. So they want to help. So they need to help around them. So that's your job, all you guys, Missouri, New Jersey, you know, Maryland. Okay? Now we're going to get on to some pictures and slides that aren't pictures. They're just papers and words. Um, <clears throat> now, I didn't bring much about um, the Society of Conservation, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, that's because when I pulled the thumb drive out of my computer at work, I thought they'd finish shutting down the had it. So it ate the slide, it all had SCD pictures on it and stuff like that. So that shows you what a techie I am. Anyway, real quick, the Society of Conservation Biology was formed about 26 years ago when people got tired of being in the other scientific societies and just sort of chronicling extinction. If we're biologists, we just measure what happens. We don't advocate for policy. We don't advocate for what works this way. They said, no, no, no. We're going to start a society that actually writes about what works in conservation. And we call it conservation biology, meaning the science that works for conservation. And it goes beyond biology. It's all the sciences, even the humanities and social sciences now, have groups within the society that work together to figure out what works in psychology, sociology, anthropology, economics. Um, so it's a lot of fun to work for these people. And um, several, well, 20 years after they were formed, basically almost, they hired me to start their policy program. And they got a bunch of foundation grants to support that. So we've had one or two or three people trying to do that at different times, depending how much money we can raise. Um, but we've essentially taken that conservation science and the law we already know about and brought it to different places that make a difference we hope. Proposing regulations, testifying in Congress, arranging for expert witnesses that can really address certain issues. And that's what we do. And uh, I hope they can kind of continue to do that. Foundation times are tough. We'll see what happens. But um, their office in DC and the website, find out all about it, is www.conbio.org. Conbio.org. And if you go to the website, you'll see tabs and policy. If you pull down on that, you can see what we've been up to the past few years. And you also see some resources, things that help you get this done work done. <coughs> um, now, by the way, interrupt me anytime you want for questions, because real, real action back and forth is more interesting than paper slides, whatever. You already went through this. Sean told you all about this. This is why you guys have what it takes to do this. These unique strengths of schools, you bring them to bear to this process. You can read as well as I can. But Sean already told you most of this stuff, except there's one little thing here. Um, it's hard to ask colleges to look out their endowments are used. But Bill McKibben at 350.org and a bunch of other people are finally asking him to do it again. As we did in South Africa's situation about 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, we, we, for a while, a lot of people stopped investing in South Africa because of apartheid. It ended, that was a campaign that actually did help make a difference. 
these things can make a difference. So think about how that might be used. Because sometimes you don't need to lose money to do the right thing, you just move it over to something else. Um, this, today, is the first step in figuring out what's important to do. You've heard from different speakers about different parts of the problem. As you make an organization, do not accept the recommendations of any one organization. Ask a lot of people, just like you're doing today. Figure out what the big gaps are. Figure out where you can help, where your leverage makes the most difference inside of yourselves. Never assume that, oh, somebody's doing that, it's therefore enough is being done. That person may need more help. That group may not have all the right answers. Think for yourselves. That's why you're going to college. Um, <clears throat> think about the carrots, the sticks, and the other tools. It's very, very hard. We have groups that work in country, like World Wildlife Fund or Conservation International, Nature Conservancy, working in country. It's hard for them to do all things we need to do. They basically have to be helpful, have to be courteous, kind, to be each other, to be brave, clean, and reverent. It's a good boy scout in the country, and it's not easy to criticize or to talk about the sticks that might be needed to be applied to the certain leadership that isn't doing the right thing there or whatever. It's hard. They have to stay in country and stay in good terms. So sometimes there are other things people can do in other countries, especially rich countries, that can help apply <coughs> either the threat of sticks or sticks as well as aid and trade and technical assistance and that kind of thing. And I'll get to come some of that in, in a minute. So, <clears throat> another thing we rarely think about is the religious community. Our religious working group on conservation biology, members of scientists, they're all scientists, good kind, but they have, they're studying the role of religion in conservation. And they have recently done a very, very well researched piece on the practice in Buddhist and Taoist circles, and some others, of mercy releases. And also, the practice, that means releasing captive wildlife to show your mercy. And sometimes those folks are releasing captive wildlife that were diseased or exotic to these ecosystems that are being released. And they're working with those communities to figure out how they can be helpful in conservation instead of detrimental. And the religious communities are welcoming that advice. They've also done peace on ivory. Believe it or not, there are a lot of temples and uh, churches that have accepted ivory parties as, as gifts of, of respect and gifts of. Uh, of uh, religious devotion, still being done. And they're reaching out to those folks and saying, wait, 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 <laughs> this doesn't help anymore. Let's show our devotion in other ways. Let's not do that anymore. And that message went out in a powerful way in Thailand during the conference parties to Cyprus, the Convention of International Trade and Endangered Species. Senior Buddhist monks said, we're not going to do this anymore. And called on all their followers not to trade in either anymore, even though tradition doesn't matter to respect. So, those kinds of motivations in the religious community can add another layer of power, as we've heard, if you work with those folks, okay? Um, you're gonna do this. You have a to-do list. But the, just like you heard, senators, the first three things you're supposed to do, well, number three on my list is to meet with your senators, representatives, and then also figure out all the different angles they can get to, not just this $20 million fund, but there are there are tools throughout the government that make a difference. Different agencies have different roles. Learn what they are and talk to those folks about those. Sometimes, for example, the World Bank can do the right thing and sometimes they can do the wrong thing. Um, so you have to pay attention and help them do the right, right thing. Um, this is a tool. A lot of people don't like to talk about it very much because it's, it's being neat. Um, but I'll talk about it. I'm a lawyer. I'm okay, lawyers and as we enforce the laws and as we prosecute people. Whatever. Initially, when we tried to manage whales and fish sustainably, uh, when, we're country, when there were countries that were sort of over-harvesting or killing more than they should have, and our fleets were trying not to disobey the limits that were set, they had to devise a way to say, no, you can't do that. The countries whose fishermen were not behaving. And so they started with the Pelley Amendment to the Fisheries Protective Act in 1967. And they said, well, you know, if a country have nationals, that is citizens, that are diminishing the effectiveness of an international conservation agreement for these resources, we can start banning their, their fish. Um, and we won't buy it unless they behave. And then they expanded that, I should say we. Um, I was involved in expanding it in 92 for the Japanese drift net practice, where they had 10 mile long drift nets, 40 feet high catching everything in the ocean and the lakes, killing everything that's around, but 
seabirds on top and they're picking the fish off the top of the net, they get caught. Dolphins and other things down below. Although that's not the main threat to dolphins, there's another thing. Point is, by that time it took a lot of clout to get Japan to give up its high seas drift net. So we amended that to say any product could be banned from a company that's diminishing the effect not only of the fisheries agreement, but also the international agreements for endangered and threatened species. That was added a few years before. And then we added the any product in about 92. When I was chief counsel at Defenders of Wildlife, we worked on that. And um, they brought that to bear, they threatened to bear against Japan. How did they do that? People petitioned the Secretary of Commerce to find that Japanese nationals were diminishing the effectiveness of that international conservation agreement by using those. Thing. And the main agreement they talked about was a UN resolution against drift net fishing at that point. And the threat of banning a series of products was, was so much that Japan really said, okay, we're going to get out of business. And so did some of the other smaller countries that used that similar technology in the Mediterranean. They made their way out of that practice and used much shorter drift nets at least. The point is, that when it really gets bad, when you have a country that is doing, whose nationals are doing a lot of harm, diminishing the effectiveness, that doesn't mean violating. It often does, but it can mean more than violating. It can mean something beyond that. If you have a market that's bringing in rhino, tiger, open ivory, and not doing enough to stop it, it's conceivable that someone might petition the Secretary of the Interior to find that that's the case and to ask them to do certain specific things in the past, this was used for <coughs> rhino and ivory once. There was a petition. China moved forward, made some improvements. Taiwan made some. And this combination of resolutions and sightings, one of which I helped to write, and the head of the Kenyan Fish and Wildlife Service, Richard Leakey, took to the floor and got it passed. And there were special envoys sent to Taiwan to get them to strengthen their laws and all that sort of thing. Point is, they were petitioned in the States and there was diplomatic and trade pressures brought to bear, and they made a little more progress. Not enough, obviously. This shows the, what the president can do. And they tried to make them in compliance with the World Trade Organization, but the World Trade Organization runs with a general agreement on tariffs and trade. What does 20B and 20G of that agreement do? It says, guess what? You can actually ban the implication of things if they're threats to human health or if they're threats to natural resources the practice that's threatening natural resources is what you're trying to get at, what you're trying to control. And if you make your own people behave, then you can apply those same standards to the products of other countries, which is what happened in the Sherman Sea Turtles decision. Better than the Tuna Dolphin decision, the WTO court upheld it, the panel said, yeah, if you make your own people stop using uh, shrimp caught without sea turtle excluded devices, you can ask other countries to do the same. If you give them a year warning, if you make it comparable and not exactly the same, and if there's some kind of agreement that you're supposed to be upholding to do that kind of thing to help sea turtles, it doesn't have to say that exact thing. If you have an international agreement that's designed to preserve that, you can apply these sanctions and you can ban this shrimp. We're not talking about banning everything made in China necessarily. That's why the word any product doesn't be decide, well, maybe we should ban this or that or it's related to this trade. But this is the hard ball. This is the strong tool that exists in the law, one of many. And the point is that even the WTO and GATT have found that this kind of thing can be used in certain circumstances. Um, but before you think about this, you've got to define, well, what do you want them to do? What should they do? And how can we provide aid and technical assistance to help that come about? Don't just whine and say, oh, they're not being nice. We have to be very specific about what can be done. We've seen some of those specifics earlier. We can ask that that be hap um, encouraged anyway, but. The Pelley Amendment sanction sometimes is the stick that, that helps it make, make it happen. Um, and even that sanction's only been used about, it's never been applied in terms of actual banning of products, but the threat of it has been found by, in scholarly articles, to work about 20 some percent of the time. Um, there's a lot here. Just know that most of the things critters are talking about in Appendix 1 of Society's elements have been Mostly on Appendix 1 since 1989 when we persuaded the world that we didn't have the five things you need to have sustainable trade in place, so you ought to go back on Appendix 1 until you have those things in place. Uh, there were a couple of one-off sales of ivory that helped provide cover for smuggling of illegal ivory. That was unfortunate. They're pretty much back up on Appendix 1 now. But that doesn't mean that the trade has stopped because it's hard to tell one from the other, you know? 
Well, I bought this legally if that went off sale. Huh? You know, so we have to do better. Um, appendix two is the appendix that says that we, we have a set of species here that are in difficult straits, but there's enough to trade them still. But you're supposed to make that binding based on the fact that they're still playing a role in their ecosystem throughout the range. In most places in the world, appendix two species really aren't playing a role in their ecosystem throughout the range. So we need to be a little bit better about enforcing that too. And appendix three is when the country says we ban the trade and all these wildlife or other things, please help us out. Uh, require an export permit before you import it. Now, if you're not bored to death yet, you might make it through Moscow. Uh, maybe not. Yeah. Um, I'll just briefly say the Convention of Biological Diversity, to which the U.S. is not party, includes almost all the other countries in the world. And it is designed to protect all biodiversity, believe it or not. It fills in the gaps where other treaties didn't have anything, and that's the kind of developed plans. It doesn't say serve, to conserve everything. The U.S. managed to knock that duty to conserve biodiversity out in the negotiations before Rio. But it does say do all these different things toward conserving it, to conserve that. And if you've listed a species in your country, as you're supposed to do, make your list of the names and species, then there's a program to save them. And they can go beyond those species listed under CITES, the Convention on International Trade. Like, well, ours, ours are broader than that. Um, CBD, therefore, is an international agreement to conserve tigers. You know, it doesn't say tigers on it. Tigers included in the Convention of Biodiversity. In the Goyo, we had a 10-year plan for the next 10 years of implementing this treaty. It called for bigger areas of protection around the world, more areas. There are, there's guidance under CBD, how to manage a forest area, which is pretty enlightening. It revised its wide. And there are all kinds of technical assistance that can be provided. Um, so if the U.S. is the party that every other nation is, and you can mind them of their duties under that treaty to do these kinds of things, if you're working with people in that country. Oh, okay. Well, I could do that. <clears throat> no, I, I probably do. Yeah. That's all right. I'll just <clears throat> gravel through it. Um, this is pretty dry stuff, so I'm going to skip some of this. But can, can you hear me without the mic? Yeah. All right. I'm cool. Um, I want to point out that a couple of things that you don't normally think about helping tigers. The climate change treaty. What's that have to do with tigers? A large part of the solution to climate change is going to be support for forested areas. They're trying to figure out how to do this right, but basically, there's going to be red. Reduce emissions through deforestation and, and forest destruction or degradation. And red plus, which means that plus a social conscience. If you find a doubling up of benefits in conserving a forested area that also conserves tigers and rhinos and elephants or whatever may be in that forested area, and people who can be paid to save that forest and help it sequester carbon, you've got a win-win-win-win-win situation, not just a win-win situation. You've got a lot of wins. So this is part of what we're trying to do. At Nagoya, when we talked at the Convention of Biodiversity meeting, we said if you're going to do red under the UNFCCC or the next Kyoto Agreement, make sure you do it with biodiversity in mind. Make sure you do it as a conventional biodiversity would have you save species and save areas. That means not just plantations of fast-growing green trees that sequester a lot of carbon. That means natural forests that in the long term can sequester even more and also provide the ecosystem services of all the species that depend on that forest, okay? So there's a tool there with a lot of money behind it potentially but it ought to be used for triple benefits or quadruple benefits of tiger conservation where it can. That is just a quick site to the place where you can see how CITES itself has recommended suspensions in trade from certain countries that are not implementing the treaty correctly. It's another stick in the rule of law. Um, but you can go to CITES.org, I think it is. You just Google CITES and you'll find the different parts of that treaty and the way, way they try to support tiger conservation. They obviously haven't been successful as they should be, but they're the main body internationally that's trying to do this in the law. See, they, this is a process for, for suspending trade when they feel that it hasn't been done successfully enough. Um, 
But that's mostly inside these species, the things that are listed. The Pelly Amendment goes further. This is about, this, I talked about the WTO doing those things. Ah, the Lacey Act. About a hundred and some years ago, in order to help enforce the laws of other countries that were trying to work with us in saving declining wildlife, which then was mostly migratory birds that were being shot for their plumage for hats and things like that, and the market honey. We said, guess what? Not only are we going to bust you, not only are we going to bust you for violating the Missouri Fish and Game Laws or the US Fish and Wildlife Service regulations, if you bring in from Canada migratory birds that you shot up there illegally across the Great Lakes and sell them or eat them or whatever, you run to jail here. We're going to support Canada and say you can't do that. You can't go across the interstate lines or international lines with illegally harvested wildlife. That's the Lacey Act, one of the first two Lacey Acts. Um, in, 19, in 2008, we managed to add plants to that, which was designed to stop the importation of illegally harvested timber, which is still epidemic throughout much of the world. We were one of the biggest markets because they harvested in Indonesia, uh, <coughs> run it into China, make it into furniture, and send it to us. Or steal it from all around China with the uh, timber in the far east of Russia, Laos, Cambodia, Burma, turn it into China, send some of it to us, and to Europe. So Europe was developing a similar thing called FLEG, forest laws, environmental, whatever. It's a very similar thing to our Lacey Act. But since those two things have been put in place, the timber trade and stolen timber has declined a lot. It's not by any means solved, but it's declining. And this can help preserve the forest upon which the tigers depend. You remember, people are talking about fuel wood, firewood, that is, and timber. To the extent that people are stealing the timber and marketing out there, these kind of things can get to that and reduce that incentive. Um, particularly if you can prove what's going on. And groups like the Environmental Investigation Agency are pretty good at, that's an NGO, by the way. Fancy name, but it's an NGO. Pretty good at going undercover and, and filming that kind of stuff and bringing some of the worst practices to light. And I happen to be on their board. We have a board meeting on Tuesday. I'm going to lean on and do even more for tigers. I've got a tiger campaign, but it could be bigger. <laughs> well, <clears throat> these are some of the things that the Lacey Act does. But uh, these are th things that it can say are violations of it. This is just a, one article from a few years ago about the difficulty that Chinese timber trade posed even to the Peruvian forests. Um, Again, that's our website. Now it's time for questions. Oh, is it time for questions yet? I think so. We're pretty much bored to death. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> now the fun part. Yes? I know that the Environmental Investigative Agency was very um, instrumental in the sightings talks just recently. Can you tell us any more about what happened over there? Well, they did a number of things. They did a paper on actually the psychology of poaching and try to figure out how, how you get in behind the whole network and figure out how people behave and how they think. But they also leaned on the, the CITES authorities to, to develop a resolution on big cats and the problem of big cats in general. They'll try to focus more attention on the problem and to provide more resources for it. We didn't get everything we wanted, but in essence that's kind of what they decided to do. There's also another track wherein CITES regularly assesses the laws and the implementation of those laws by other parties, tries to provide some advice, and if the parties don't have the proper legal and physical work in place, they can issue suspension orders for particular species or for all wildlife subject to CITES. That's going to be done again. The question is quite how, how soon, but they're, they're stepping up the things in terms of the number of months, particularly for treaties, parties that don't have this stuff in place and they've been part of the treaty for over 20 years. A lot of times they just haven't done anything. And so they pushed them ahead in those two, two fronts. Um, that's the short answer to that. So, yeah. Uh, even David, you and everybody seems to be talking about talking to senators for 
law enforcement or legislation or bills. Is there any background you can enlighten the students at least to me, being an outsider? Has there been any efforts which have been made till date? Has it reached anywhere so that there is this confidence among the students to reach out to senators? May I be talking? Does it help? Or has it been effective somewhere before to get any bill or any legislation? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, a absolutely. Um, <sighs> I mean, uh, there's so many times where I, I hard to think of, of where to start. Um, we wouldn't have done, I'll give you an example, just, just one example. When you buy a can of tuna in the, stu in the store, you see the little label on the side, you ever see the Dolphin Safe label? Students did that. Throughout the state of California, elementary students and high school students were boycotting tuna because they couldn't tell which one was caught on dolphin and which one was not. When I say caught on dolphin, you can tell everybody that's a silly microphone. To catch tuna in the eastern top of the city, the cheapest, quickest way since they invented hydraulic winches to circle the tuna up with two speedboats carrying big nets, drop the weights under the tuna of the pod, that is, that you chase the dolphins because the yellow ones into them underneath for protection against sharks. Because dolphins have got sharks away, nothing else can, so they swim underneath the dolphins. Um, the speedboats chase them down, tire them out, drop big nets underneath, cinch the nets under, and then draw them up and pull them into the big boats, big 400-ton sailors. Um, those catch dolphins and tuna at the same time, and a lot of the dolphins drown if they're not careful or get caught in them and just get squished. And this is a little bit cheaper than fishing them one at a time from the boats like they used to before they had the hydraulic winches. But to make more money, they did it this way. Even though the dolphins had always guided them to the tuna without much pain, you know, they did the food. Um, and that time, for many years, there were somewhat li lower limits set a few times, but not enough. And the Mexican fleet grew as ours reduced, was, and so it was a, continued to be a difficult practice, killing a lot of dolphins. So the tuna was boycotted in California by elementary students, high school students, and that boycott started to spread all across the country until either the practice was stopped or at least we put a label on the cans that said this was not caught by setting those nets on dolphins at all. And this one without a label, we had, when we first drafted the law, and I helped write that one too for Senator Boxer, which he was a congressman, um, we said every tuna the can has to have a label, either dolphin deadly or dolphin safe. And they were pretty scared of that dolphin deadly label on the tuna can. You know, <laughs> didn't want that. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so as soon as she announced that she was going to have hearings on it and scheduled, I think it was April 12, 1993 or so, um, we had a dolphin coalition, I was the chair, and we had a former observer, a dolphin observer from the boats who used to watch and count the dolphins that died. He just did an editorial saying, we don't need to do this. There are two in the Western Pacific that don't swim with dolphins. We can catch those. Just a little more expensive to go to the West and say, so he said, you can do that. Or we can put a label on it. They basically fired him for the National Marine Fishery Service for doing that because they were embarrassed by the truth. So he came to DC and let's put labels on cans. He said, sick, good idea. So we formed a coalition to do it. Got Barbara Bach to introduce the legislation. The day she announced hearings, the tuna companies realized that if this bill moved, they'd all have to put labels on the cans. They couldn't sell tuna unless they had a dolphin safe label in the United States. So that very day, they announced all three of the big ones that they were going dolphin safe. And the reason they knew they couldn't sell it was that the boycott had informed schools all over the country. Children informed their families, their mothers, don't buy this tuna. They informed the school systems, we won't go to the cafeteria and eat that tuna unless we know it's dolphin safe. So they're all boycotted. And they knew that the language and the knowledge is already out there. And that the bill would be successful, it wouldn't just sit on the shelf. So that's good, one good example. Um, and it's still a lot of day. Um, and there, there are many others. We, we, <coughs> I must say, if you, if you get the Public Interest Research Group newsletter, which nobody does, but if you did, you'd see that students at campuses around the country every year have successes in improving the state laws, and sometimes they have successes in, in, in the federal system. So, I mean, I could go on all day long, you don't want that about what students have done. A question? So yes, I got to off of that question. Uh, do you have any advice for us, for, I know you have a lot of experience do you have any advice for us and for those of us who are new in the room 
um, and getting involved in the whole issue too, to corral us together as one. You know? Yeah. Like, what, what can we do to ensure that we're all stable and also to expand out as a, as a national? I'll give you more this afternoon, but I'll give you a couple things now. Continuity. You want to make sure that on your steering committees, on your boards in each campus, you have people at different levels of the process. That you want to make sure you've got freshmen and sophomores involved, get them involved early. You want to make sure you've got some graduate students, if you have a university with graduate students, have them involved too on different projects. You, you, you can take advantage of a lot of different things. But what you want to do is keep the continuity so that you don't lose your critical mass. They don't also become seniors and graduate and no one can follow up. That's one thing. Second thing is get some kind of funding that's pretty steady. The PERGs were formed originally with the idea of being part of student fees to fund public interest research. And it sounded good because at that time they were telling us all to get out of the street, stop marching, work through the system. We said, okay, we'll do that. Do we have an activity fee just like the sailing club and the rifle club do? Or we can have a little part of that to be okay anyway? They said, okay, it sounds good, citizenship. Well, that kind of frightened because we began actually cutting effective. You know, we cut utility rate increases that didn't deserve to be given. We did things like that. We said, oh my goodness, our donors are getting upset. You can't have those fees anymore, so we had to go door to door and get money. But you can usually find some funding, particularly if it's not threatening the donors, um, to fund us an activity like this, to do an activity fees or something like that. So get funding, get continuity, be organized, have, have committees to do different things and people respond, you know, responsible. Then link up with the similar committees in the other campuses. So you have all your fundraising chairs talking to each other fairly often. All your program chairs talking to each other about what's important on the Hill now, and not just saying, oh, well, here's the first thing that comes along. Maybe it is important. What, what do you hear about? What do you hear about? What's our agenda going to be? And how are we going to press that together so that all of us begin to these four or five members of the appropriation committee about the same two or three things. And they're going, gee, this is a nationwide effort. We can get it. We've got to do this. Yeah. And, and then continuity with your relationship with your members of Congress. Don't just visit them once. Become their friend or at least their polite nagger. <laughs> <laughs> A few ideas, that's all. Nagging can never be polite. <laughs> well, you can, you can be somewhat polite. Yes? Um, I want to amplify just a little bit on what you just said, because I have personal experience uh, with the conservation of tigers. And, and my piece of advice that I know that I was going to bring up was, was, uh, group was simply that uh, you have to have a focus. And you all have to be all focused at the same point. Yes. Because there is a huge, huge uh, pressure and, and inclination for different people and different organizations want to take the leadership role. Yes. And you lose the, uh, the, the, the consensus yes. of, 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 of the army of one, and that's what you have to be. Yes. For example, for 15 years, I was on the island of Sumatra. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's about nine national parks from the north to the south. It's, it's an island the size of the state of California. And I was given permission by the authorities to work in three different places, but I was prohibited from going to the places where WWF worked, yes. where Conservation International worked, yes. and where uh, uh, CI worked. Uh, and I, I was barred. I, I couldn't go up and collaborate. There were places I wanted to go and do surveys because I had, I had the staff, I had the funds, and I wanted to start figuring out how many tigers were left in the forest. Couldn't do it because it was all so fragmented and everyone is sort of chasing the same amount of money from the same organizations. You start losing your focus, you start losing your traction, you start losing your impetus, you give up. Well said. I want to share one absolutely like uh, Ron has said, in India, the, the people who are interested in conservation is now between the age of 60 to 75. Any committee, set five number of names of people. National committee, same names. International invitees, same five people. Anywhere, those five faces. Though we have billion people in the country, but when it comes to representing India in the world of conservation, you are stuck with those half a dozen names. Coming to organizations, WWF is a giant. Then we have 
maybe a couple of two or three other organizations who are having staff of 30, 40, whatever it is. So the competition is so much that, you know, India is not, by the way, lagging behind in funds. We have enough funds to do that. But there is a fashion. That is a fashion maniac to seek funding from outside because of the reason that there is a label attached. I'm being blunt. So the reason is this, that for one particular project of Tiger, this is, this is a thing which you must know. I'm, I'm sharing my feelings with Ron, who has spent 12 long years in Indonesia, and the moment he left, the project fell through. We don't know how long I'm going to live for somebody else who's doing this job. But the thing which can keep these organizations is, is under scanner by the government of India is this, that every fund which is coming from the global points are being given to these three to four five organizations. Why? Because we refuse to recognize anybody else doing this. It's a rarity for somebody else, like individual like me, I'm being forthright to come to a forum like this or maybe in the country. I work on the ground, I, I remain unnoticed there and I have no regrets. But that's something different. But the, the more you go into this, as a coalition, you may have too many fragmented opinions. One school which is bigger might say, OK, my eight students would go. The uh, university which is going to have lesser number will say, OK, we take a secondary role. So it's a very, very important issue, A, where you are going, B, what is your focus, three, there are no egos. Because while we are implementing these programs, these are the issues which are going to come in your way. So the people who are going to represent their schools have to put their egos behind and go forward in one focus to talk of legislation or seek demands on <coughs> those particular two points only. And that's why I dif beg to differ, there can be no polite nagging. It has to be aggressive nagging. <laughs> there cannot be other way other than go forthright and put your point across. I don't believe in negotiating. It's non-negotiable for me. Because unless you're aggressive, you're forthright, you're young. Your blood is hot and young. But diplomacy also has to be aggressive. You will never achieve it. And uh, mark my experience, I have fought single-handedly with the Supreme Court for seven years. And I was opposed by eight, ten people, the government councils, the state government, the central government, persistent pace. After seven years, I was able to get the census methodology on the Central Government Act. And I have fought single-handedly in Assam to get the punishment for life imprisonment from, from three years to life imprisonment in one state. And it has got a presidential asset. But I was never polite. <laughs> I, I was absolutely rude. But at the same time, I was persistent. So the person sitting across the chair, he knows that he is a representative. After all, he is going to get the votes from you. You are public. Know your power. Know your rights. Then come across, focus it, sit together, and see this is achievable. This is non-negotiable. This has to be done and set a calendar. India is your focus 2014. Come what may, you have to visit. Whether it is four, whether it is six, whether it is eight, we give you subsidized, we give you cheap accommodations. You can rough it out, but make it. That's the way you have to look for your goal. That's what I wanted to share my sentiment as we then, because it takes a lot of hard work to go. Today you might go back and say, I want to do a lot about tigers. That's not going to help you. You have to keep getting connected. You have to keep getting motivated within yourselves. And as the rough pages which we have shared, it's, it has not taken us one night, overnight to be here. It's, been a, it's a lot of hard work. Be prepared for it. You might just get a job next month. You say, OK, I'm going. Bye. I'm getting 50,000 bucks. Let me go. Somebody will say, oh, I have a boyfriend waiting for me to get married. I have to go. So all these things get, will get broken. And then you suddenly see the membership going down. And this coalition can fall apart. But I'm not wishing that. For that, as he's very rightly said, and I support him totally with his uh, commitment and David coming and make use of it. Go for it. Does anybody else have any more questions? <laughs> so, at one level, we can write letters, right? And we can engage with senators and representatives of staff. At another level, we could challenge the government to take on China. Good. Anything in between. I mean, Lots of things in between. What is, what is the, uh, 
the will of the State Department now. And it seems like Hillary Clinton was very powerfully motivated for wildlife, international wildlife, in her final years. Final months. Final months. But there are all these new crises on the world stage. What, what's the future? What's the next year or two? What's the opportunity for us? You raised the most important question for the moment. And that is because he's absolutely right in getting at the transition. We now have new secretaries, new leadership, and have the department that we care about here. New Secretary of Interior, new Secretary of State, new Secretary of Commerce, new head of EPA, new head of OMB, Office of Management Budget, where they often stop the regulations from coming to light, coming out of the agencies, like the one to ban all the pythons, because both constrictors are coming into the country. OMB said to Dan Ash, no, you can only have a ban on four or five of those pythons. That's why the fact they've eaten every endangered species in the Everglades. We have to have a few pet jobs, pet trade jobs, so let the other four or five in. That wasn't very smart, but that happens. So we have to educate those new leaders and those new agencies and educate President Obama in the process and tell them, guess what? You don't have to worry about your reelection. You've already been reelected. You can't get reelected again since FDR, so just get it done. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and we have to give them the, the tools to do it. We say, look, you've got the laws. Here are good regulations you can put in place whether it's dealing with captive endangered species here, either for hunts or for petting or whatever, or whether it's importing more, or those kind of things, they've got great regulatory power. And this is the time to educate those people, and you all can help do that too. Both through the members of Congress that form their oversight committees that on the Natural Resources Committee in the House, on Environment Committee in the Senate, and on the Appropriations Committee, they all can lean on these guys and women to do the right thing in these new leadership positions that they have. And then you can also communicate with them directly. You can try to arrange briefings. It's hard when you're not in D.C. to do that. But you can also ask your senators and congresspersons to do that. For instance, even the normal member of Congress from this district is on one of the relevant committees. Third District of South Carolina, believe it or not. So they have oversight, and they have appropriations, and they have authorizing. All three of those functions, yes? Oh, just to add to to the question. Um, the new Secretary of State, as you guys probably know, is John Kerry, former Senator John Kerry. And he is encouraging, he introduced the um, bill that I was talking about, the Big Cats bill, in the Senate last session. So, I mean, clearly he's on our side in that respect. I mean, in, in a lot of trade respects, actually. Yeah, Kerry has a much, much broader, longer record on these things than did Clinton, Hillary Clinton. Her daughter got to her very nicely. Um, they had a big conference on wildlife crime where you all had a delegation in attendance. And she had some people do some good things toward the end, but Carrie can, can follow up and do a lot, a lot more. We're actually trying to land the briefing. Tom Lovejoy, who's a fairly famous conservation biologist, is works for Heinz Center, where John Carrie's wife is the chairwoman of the institution. And we're trying to set up a briefing for Carrie and some of his new people on our recommendations in these areas which you'll see on our website on Monday. Um, we call it Obama 2.0. That's the informal name for it. It's recommendations for the next term. You know, upgrade, better than we hope than Microsoft Gate or whatever it is. So anyway, <laughs> next question. Any more? You're all ready for lunch. <laughs> Thank you.